Dotcom Secrets by Russell Brunson. This presentation is brought to you by Gadget Media. Special offer for those business and franchise owners that qualify. See how Mike and the rest of Gadget Media use Facebook to fill your business with new customers even if you don't have a marketing team or experience with Facebook. If you're looking for help starting or managing your Facebook lead generation efforts, reach out to Mike and he will build you a custom lead generation funnel at no cost. You just cover the ad spend. No massive upfront costs or long-term contracts. It's as simple as that. Just call 949-371-6801 or check out their website at gadgetmedia.co for your Facebook marketing needs. I've also linked to their site in the description. This video is for anybody that's interested in building a internet-based business. However, the principles covered can also be applied to an offline business or a business that's a hybrid, whether you generate leads offline and sell your clients online, or you generate your leads online and sell your clients offline and fulfill the service offline or any varying combination of the two. You see, one of the important concepts of all good business building is the sound principles of direct response marketing. And Russell Brunson has been a fan of direct response marketing. There's a interesting picture of him when he was a kid holding a box of all these clippings of different direct response marketing ads and different kinds of clippings from newspapers and so forth because he was a huge fan of studying why people buy, what they buy, how to target people, how to convert people. And this is the essence and the important pieces when you go down this journey of direct response marketing because that's what direct response marketing is. It's action-oriented marketing in part and in whole of the entire sequence. So a funnel, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and I'll even show you a visual representation, is the business. Okay? It's the entire business. And a lot of times we think when we see a business selling a product that that's the totality of how they generate their revenue. If that's what they're doing, oftentimes they're leaving a lot of money on the table. One of the things that I learned in business and I continue to integrate in what I'm involved with and with my clients is multiple streams of income from varying sources and varying degrees from varying strategies. And this is a process that can multiply the revenue, multiply your profits and open up your possibilities for even expanding into new sub niches and even new businesses and new markets and allows you to form really powerful relationships with others because a lot of times you're not just going to do this internally, you're going to do this through partnerships with others. And the possibilities are endless. And the ability to grow your business is really powerful. And what this is what I find to be one of the key differentiators of successful business entrepreneurs who really get a lot of success and can pivot and can go in different directions really fast is they're able to see opportunities that exist within their sphere of control or the opportunities that exist within the networks of those that they're connected to and figure out how to monetize those opportunities using, use, utilizing various different strategies. So it's important to really broaden your awareness and understanding of this concept called funnels. And funnels, which we're going to show you a little visual representation, is you could say a process in which a client or a, I should say a business generates their leads, converts the leads, and then continues to convert the leads into ongoing business. This is very related to the J. Abraham's three ways to grow your business strategy, which essentially says that there's only three ways to grow your business. Increase the amount of clients, increase the transactional value of your clients, and increase the frequency in which they come back and buy from you again and again and again. And the goal is to increase in all three areas. And there is an infinite amount of combinations and permutations to increase in these three areas. And you learn this through the journey and you get more astute and you know how to work with this. So that really offers a lot of value for your clients. Because the idea is not just to make a lot of money, but is to create a lot of value by using this combination and permutation of the three ways to grow your business. And that's applied directly to the funnel. So a funnel is a map or a process for generating traffic, bringing them over to specific content or opt-in pages. And this is a very rough one that I created just to articulate the point. As you can see, we got multiple sources of traffic. We got YouTube fa uh, free traffic, Facebook free traffic, Instagram free traffic, Facebook paid traffic. 
And this traffic is driven to various forms of pieces of content, whether it is YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. It's targeted content. It's designed to capture and build a relationship with somebody who has no experience with dealing with you before. And the idea is to move this interaction into a buying relationship to solve a specific problem and a frustration that they have with your product or service or something that you can partner with somebody else to create, essentially an affiliate relationship, joint venture, etc. I'm not going to get into that. And then we have emails that go out to them that engage them further to build a relationship with them further as we try to get them to buy our product or service because it's a valuable fit for them. It'll solve a problem. And then if they buy that, we offer higher level upsells, downsells, and different kinds of products and services that can benefit them over the long term in not just what is the problem that they're trying to solve, but because we have that relationship with them, we connect them with other products or services that maybe can solve other problems in their lives. So you can see there's a lot of opportunity if we start to think this way. And the offers can range in various price points. This really depends on what you're selling, products and services, etc. But fundamentally in a funnel, the products and service price points tend to rise up as they convert. For example, if they buy a $50 product and they have a good relationship with you, then you can offer them a $200 product or $200 service, and they're more likely to invest at a higher price point because they have trust with you. And then it can go into $500 and $2,000 and $10,000 and $50,000. It's kind of difficult to get somebody to, if you find them on the internet through paid traffic, to invest $50,000 in whatever it is you're offering to solve a problem that they have right off the gate. Selling somebody for on something that's $50,000 requires a ability to nurture that relationship and that nurturing of the relationship is done in the funnel. And sometimes it involves phone calls and different kinds of call to actions and emails so they can get to know you, pieces of content, lower price point offers so they can get an exposure as to what you're about and how what you have actually solves problems for them as you move down the relationship, ideally from cold lead who has no idea who you are to a very solid relationship and when they can entrust you for a high level offer like a 10 or 25 or $50,000 offer or even partnership revenue shares, etc. So that's essentially what a funnel is. And there's many ways of looking at funnels, many different permutations and combinations. And a lot of the information on funnels is covered extensively in this book. So I recommend that you read this book. It's a very sound book and it's based on Russell Brunson's experience, not just in his business, but his client's business because he owns a company called ClickFunnels and ClickFunnels offers a software. Or it is a piece of software that allows you to create landing pages, opt-in pages, sales pages, checkout pages, everything you need for a funnel. It's a funnel software. That's why it's called ClickFunnels. And it's very powerful and it's used by a lot of marketers and there have been very successful entrepreneurs generated as a result of using ClickFunnels, but not just using the software, actually basing it on sound direct response marketing principles, understanding the principles in the book as well as the principles we're gonna talk about in the video, as well as the principles that I had discussed with Roy Fur in that video we did on email marketing and direct response marketing. So if you haven't seen that, I recommend that you watch it. I'll put a link in the description. So let's go ahead and get started on the pieces of funnels. And even though we looked at a visual representation, how does a funnel actually become successful? Well, there are four more, uh, four important questions we want to ask ourselves. And number one is who is your dream client? You see, the goal is to create hyper-targeted messages. So you have to know your target market inside out. Successful businesses get inside of the customer's mind and find out what the individual really cares about. What are their pains and their frustrations? What do they desire? What do they think about? And what do they search for online? When you can find out these tiny details, you can search more specifically and find buyers in not so obvious places. See, if you have a product or service or you're interested in getting started in business and you want to create a product or service, it's important to investigate and look at all the different areas different people hang out online. Facebook groups, YouTube channels, different kinds of forums, Reddit. There's a lot of different places where people congregate and they hang out and they talk about their pains and frustrations. And successful marketers know that this is happening and they go over there and they 
interact and they connect with people and they observe and they read and they try to figure out what their pains and frustrations really mean as far as solutions and they go out and create those solutions but they also are aware of who they want to serve profit margins and the different kinds of competition that's available or that is existent in that particular space and if if it's worth it to do a partnership deal with the competition so they can get in on a better advantage or directly go head up against the competition eventually growing their business and selling their business out to the competition all those kind of questions and thought processes need to be thought of as far as figuring out who your dream client really is and for me I one of my important aspects of a dream client is I want to make sure that I'm having a great time interacting with my clients. So I try to work in businesses and opportunities in which the clients are really pleasant to deal with. Some opportunities, some areas in business, the clients can be really difficult and demanding and frustrated depending on the product or service. If you have a deep understanding of marketing principles, and this is why I always say it's so important to learn direct response marketing, copywriting, consultative selling, then you have the advantage to go out and pick which niche that you want to participate in and you'll always find some really clever ways of penetrating that market and building a business in there but if you don't have good understanding of business building or direct response marketing copywriting consultative selling and really what drives buying decision if you don't have the knowledge behind that then you're always going to be at the mercy of the competition because get this the dream clients the perfect clients and the most profitable clients are probably in areas where there is competition and it's not absolute there's ways around this where others are serving so you always have to figure out how you can better serve those clients and I recommend watching the videos that Jay Abraham did on the strategy of preeminence that's his core philosophy if you understand and you integrate the strategy of preeminence when you're connecting with your dream clients then you will differentiate and you'll separate yourself from the competition and your market will see you as the trusted advisor in those areas so study those videos next is where can you find them one of the coolest things about the internet is the power of congregations these seemingly unimportant groups of people gather together in little corners of the internet making it possible for people like you and me to get into business quickly and be successful without all the barriers and expensive hurdles of traditional media so think about this from you know back in the days if you wanted to reach a market your forms of advertising would be TV or newspaper and other expensive forms of advertising which had a lot of regulation so you know you had to make sure everything was set up a certain way and you had to pay these fees and a lot of times it would be a big risk but nowadays it's actually a lot easier you could figure out what you're passionate about what problems you like to solve and you can find out where those people exist they may exist on YouTube they may exist on Facebook they may exist on Instagram or they can exist somewhere in a forum those are usually the places that I like to start or they can exist on Amazon because a lot of people are searching for products or services they buy one product or service and you can see what else they buy Amazon shows you that there's a lot of tools to help you mine that data and you can figure out what else you can offer and the kind of language they use and where else they hang out for example if somebody talks about a specific kind of knowledge or expertise that they're looking to build they're probably hanging out in similar places outside of that form so that's something you want to keep in consideration remember your target market is made up of real people so you need to look at their real behavior where do they hang out online where do they spend their time what email newsletters might they subscribe to what blogs do they read what Facebook groups are they part of and they even are they even on Facebook or they prefer Instagram because one platform might be good for some market but might not be good for another market and or are they searching for specific terms on Google what are they searching for and why are they searching for those terms you really need to dig deep into the psychology of your prospect and you know this might seem like a lot of work but this is an ongoing journey the more you invest in really learning about your prospect and market the better you get at creating products and services or partnering with others who create products and services so you could serve that market and build a very profitable funnel both selling front-end low-ticket items and high-end items 
What books should they buy from Amazon? Answering these questions can take some time and research, but it's worth taking as much time as you need to develop a clear picture of where your ideal clients are directing their attention. So one of the things that I like to do is I hang out predominantly in the places where my prospects and clients hang out, online and offline. And I'm always asking questions and I'm always spending a lot of time listening. And what I'm interested is listening, again, to their pains and frustrations because that's where I create the solutions. And I'm usually known for selling really well, and I could sell really well if I'm in different places and so forth. And the secret to my ability to sell is really based on my ability to listen. Okay, listen to what they say and then figure out how to craft an offer that solves the pain points better than anyone else and persuade them to, and realistically so, solve the problems better than anyone else. So. We want to keep in consideration that there's three types of traffic. Traffic that you control, traffic you don't control, and then traffic that you own. So let's talk about this. Traffic that you control. You control traffic, and when we're saying traffic, we're using online terminology. This, these are people, okay? Visitors, individuals that are browsing the internet and so forth, or doing different kinds of things. It's important to see them as human beings and people, and even though it's traffic, each visitor is a real person. They're interacting and they're engaging with you. So we want to treat them appropriately. And this is why the strategy of preeminence is so important. You control traffic when you have the ability to tell it where to go. For example, if I purchase an ad on Google, I don't want that traffic. I don't want that traffic. Google does. But I can control it by buying an ad and then sending those who click on that ad anywhere I want. Any kind of paid traffic is traffic you control including the following. Okay, so email ads, pay-per-click ads, banner ads, native ads, affiliate or joint ventures. And then traffic you don't control. So this would be social media traffic like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, search traffic, guest uh, posts on blogs, YouTube, guest interviews. Now, just like the traffic that I control, and I'm quoting from the book, my only goal with traffic that I don't control is to turn that traffic into traffic that I own. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. You see, these kind of sources of traffic, sources of visitors, uh, might not last. You never know. These kind of platforms could be shut down or your profile could be shut down or whatnot. And so we always want to make sure we are hedging our bets. And one of the best ways to do it is to encourage the visitors from those sites to join you onto your mailing list or your email mailing list or other platforms that you can have just in case something goes wrong and it gets shut down. I have an email list that's been built over the course and duration of the last few years of growing this channel. And if anything were to happen with this channel, you know, I have my content backed up and so forth, but I also have a list of subscribers who I've built a relationship with that I can notify if I decided to move into a different platform and so forth. But you don't have absolute control. And even though there's a lot you could do with these kind of platforms as far as your marketing goes, and you can build successful businesses on these platforms, just imagine, like think of these uh, businesses that are built on Instagram. If they're not building a list of individuals that are clients and nurturing and even prospects, not just clients, but prospects, if for some reason, you know, terms of service or whatever, the Instagram profile is shut down, they literally lose their business overnight. So it's very important to diversify your traffic sources. Next is the traffic that you own. So this is traffic you own is the best kind of traffic. It's your email list, your followers, your readers, your customers, etc. It's important to take your past clients, customers, your followers, and consolidate them in an email mailing list and to engage them on a regular basis. And that's why I, uh, Roy Fur and I made that video all about email list building. We recommend you watch it. I put the link in the description. This is essentially what we want to do. So when we attract our prospects, we want to bring them over to our email list. But we want to attract targeted prospects, not just random people and just everyone on our email list. We want to figure out what our ideal client looks like, our dream client. We want to figure out where they hang out. And we want to draw them in through various content and positioning ourselves as a leader, authority in that space over to our email list so we can continue building a relationship with them and offering value to them and making offers for paid products and services in which they get value from and they get results from and that, that continues the relationship down the funnel. Next, what bait will you use to attract them? 
So the thing about this is that when you're engaging with someone who's already checking email, Facebook, or on a cell phone at the exact same time, you have to do a little interruption. And you have to interrupt them long enough so that they will click on your ad and visit your website, engage with your content, and then go down and email you or give you their email address, I should say, or contact you if it's the call to action. So this is something to really think about too, is that you can't get people, you can't force people to do things because people are doing things the way they want to do things. But what I like to do is I always like to think about what's the attractive thing that's actually a value to them. Now, you know, there's others that like to do things to tr distract somebody and so forth. And, you know, sometimes those kind of strategies will work to your disadvantage if you don't deliver on that distraction. But in a way, as marketers, we're always being a little distractive and encouraging someone to look at what we have with the goal that what we have is going to actually benefit them and it was well worth their time. So we have to think about what are the different ways that we can attract them. Videos, images, content, reports, case studies, maybe some offer for a sample. They are on these different platforms doing things and there are ads running, you'll see them all over the place. And someone who has really set up their ads properly will really understand the depth of causing that distraction, but then bringing them over to something that's actually valuable. And there is a lot in this realm and a lot, a lot of depth and a good book to read is Scientific Advertising by Claude Hopkins. So let's talk about the attractive character. So this is a persona you're sharing with your audience and how you communicate with your list. Most people either don't bring bother to create this character or they don't do it correctly. So what I want to explain to you is a process. Okay, it's one of the most important steps you can take when it comes to making sales. Once you intentionally create your AC or attractive character, your business is going to change forever. And these are the four elements. Number one is the backstory. You share your backstory because you want people to see where you came from. If they can relate to where you came from, then they will want to follow you to where you are now. If they don't see the backstory, potential customers won't follow you or listen to you. You'll seem untouchable and you won't seem real to them. However, if they see that you were once in a similar situation, then they instantly identify with you and will follow you. Your story has provided a hook. You then lay out the path and they will want to follow that path. Number two, attractive characters speak in parables. A parable is a story about something that happened in your attractive character's life. Most people let life pass them by and don't stop to take note of the interesting things that happen to them. But you're different. You have the ability to use the things that happen throughout your life to teach and inspire others as well as pro sell your products and service. You know, there's a saying, people buy from who they like and they trust. A lot of the individuals and a lot of clients that I have are very similar to me. And because there was a certain journey that I won, I went on in entrepreneurship and even the other businesses that I'm involved with where I sell solutions to problems. I had been down various paths and one of the things that I like to do is I like to articulate and I do it through words or I do it through the content peppered in, in there that I've been through a similar experience and the audience can feel that. They feel that I am like them and that I can relate to them and I can understand them in ways that other people don't understand them because I've been through that similar journey. So what I tend to do in entrepreneurship and business is I target those that have been through or are going through what I went through because I've been there and there's actually a lot that have been through or are going through what I have been through. And my goal is to level them up. So if you're watching this video, you might resonate with this, level you up so that you can get more results, so we can build a relationship and you can get more success in your business and so forth. And this is the same even when I had my IT business. I had been through a lot of experiences with IT and so forth. And I understand the pains and frustrations of companies that would have their employees having issues with the IT and how it relates to their workflow and inefficiencies and so forth. And by creating solutions, products, and different kinds of proposals, and presenting it in a way that I understood them by sharing my experiences with them during the consultative selling, it built further rapport and built a relationship and really influenced the buying decision. Attractive characters share their character flaws. 
So no one wants to hear about the perfect person because you can't relate. Yet most of us try to put on a perfect facade for our audiences. Conversely, as soon as the audience knows you're not perfect, that you have character flaws, then they will start to empathize with you. They like you more because you are like them, not perfect. So we are trying to get our audience, we are working to get our audience to a higher level, a level that we're at right now, or levels higher in the journey that we had gone through, you know, based on where they are, levels higher to the different levels that we were at, so they can keep rising up as we grow. But at the same time, there are going to be levels where you're going to go higher. So realness is very important. Authenticity is felt through the communication, through the voice, and through the empathy that you share through your communication. And one of the big important elements of this is essentially self-acceptance, accepting who you are as a person and recognizing that you don't have to be perfect when you're doing all these things. So a lot of people come to me and say that they want to create YouTube videos or create a social media presence and you know build a business surrounding their passion and who they are. But they're afraid to create content, uh, content because of the fear of criticism, essentially one of the fears from Think and Grow Rich, the fear of criticism. They're afraid to do it. People who create content from an authentic place usually end up attracting a larger audience and an audience that's more likely to trust them than those that just try to pretend to be someone that they're not or put on a facade and lie because people can sense that. So being authentic and just you know putting out the way you've got the presentation skills or your level of self-esteem or whatever you've got right now, whoever you are, just starting from that place is really beneficial because you get started, number one. And number two is, yeah, you get better with time. You start to improve. And even improving on the journey can be very powerful as far as relationship building and connecting with the audience. Because if you're in certain industries, as you grow with your audience and they can kind of see where you came from, they believe it's doable because it really is doable. And they watch the evolution and they see how you grow and they believe that they can do it as well. And part of that is accepting your flaws. Attractive characters, number four, harness the power of polarity. Active characters are typically very polarizing. They share their opinions on hard matters, and they stick to their guns no matter how many people disagree with them. They draw the line in the sand, and when they take a stand for what they believe in, they split the audience into three camps. Those who agree with them, those who are neutral, and those who will disagree with them. As you start to create polarization, it will change your fair weather fans into diehard fans who will follow what you say, share your message, and buy from you over and over again. So the idea behind this is it's, you know, you have to have something that you believe in, it's who you are, and the goal is to connect with the audience, but at the same time, sticking to your guns, what you believe in. And what you believe in might be different than what is accepted from others, but understand this. There are people probably looking for your way of thinking. And your way of thinking might be unique and really resonate, provided that it's coming from an authentic place and that it actually translates into something that's valuable and concrete because, you know, random thinking and that's not valuable is probably not going to lead to buying decisions. But really valuable thinking that's unique and oftentimes polarizing and can seem very conflict or conflicting to popular ideologies can create a very powerful niche market in which you have the results and it's really based on your thinking that you created the results. And so as you demonstrated that in your content, that the thinking a certain way actually produces the results and the way of thinking is polarizing and different than how others communicate or how others think, your audience now trusts you as the person that can help them think that same way and understand things from that perspective and actually ideally then create the results that you created through this process. And then finally, what, does, what results do you want to give them? So as you're building and really looking at how you are going to set up your business, you know, going through who your dream client is going to be, where can you find them, what bait you will use to attract them, because especially in the starting you have to come up with stuff that's going to take their attention away from what they're doing. I mean, that's the game of the internet is that people are doing all kinds of different things. And if you've got something interesting that's going to take them away from what they're doing and just kind of you know look at what you have to offer and then see 
how valuable it is, build a relationship with you and go down that process, then that's how you play the game really well. So you have to think about that. And if you want to turn this into business, it can't just be about these three things. It's got to be about what result do you want to give them? So it's essentially a solution to a problem that they have. And you have to deliver this solution really well. And it has to be a solution that oftentimes might not be available anywhere else or is not delivered in a certain fashion. And it's very unique to who you are and your style. That's the way I like to do it. But it doesn't absolutely have to be that way. You can still sell products or services that are similar to your competitors or even exact matches to your competitors. And you might have better marketing and so forth. But that's something you want to think about. Okay, who is your ideal client and what are the problems and frustrations that they have and how could you solve their problems and frustrations? You know, I say this all the time. I don't like to start businesses with, I have a great idea and then try to go and sell the idea. I mean, some people do do that and it ends up working. And a better way of doing it is to just look at and observe and just study, make it a thing to figure out what the different, different pains and frustrations are in the niche that you're interested in, the sub niches, maybe based on your skills, or maybe you'll find that in a certain area where you have to acquire the skills. But essentially, you find that pain and frustration, and then you figure out how to solve that pain and frustration. And even if you can't solve it yourself, you do a partnership deal with somebody who can solve that and work something out and you know work on developing the business side of it or the marketing side of it and work in, in synergy with the other person you know, through interdependence to provide that product or service into the marketplace or to that audience that gives them the solution that they desire, the result. Okay, it's about the result. People pay for the results. And the marketing helps persuade them to recognize that you have the results. You have to think about this all throughout the funnel, these four important questions. So now let's get into the funnel. Okay, the concept of value leader is essentially steps in the funnel. The deeper your funnel is, the more things you can offer your clients, the more each customer will be worth to you. And the more they are worth to you, the more you can spend to acquire them. Remember this truth. So as we're building our business, we have to think about all the things that they buy, all the things that they potentially would buy before, during, after, or instead of the thing you're offering to really recognize what are the different opportunities available where we can create or partner with those others products or services to fulfill those needs and add them to our funnel. Now, when you start out in a business, it's good to not make this overwhelming and complex. I think a lot of people make a mistake when they get involved with creating funnels, they get too sophisticated in the beginning. Start with maybe one or two levels or three levels deep, okay? Front end offer, a back end offer to that, a higher ticket item, and maybe a third one, or even just if that's going to take too long, just start with a basic funnel in which you're generating leads, sending a couple emails and converting them over to one offer. Just start with something basic like that and optimize. And then as you get to know that market, those prospects, your clients, then you can add more to the back end. And that's how I like to do things. And then as you revisit content like this or you improve your knowledge of direct response marketing and all the different business building principles, you come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things that will help to dimensionalize the different products and services that you can offer as a result of opportunities that you see now based on experience of being in that business for an extended period of time. I did a video a while back on the Abraham Mindshift Challenge, a book by Jay Abraham. I'm going to recommend that you watch that video because it has in there a number of different strategies and scenarios, different combinations of working with different aspects of assets and opportunities that you may have right now to create complementary products and services to build upon this value ladder. But let's look at the basic value ladder. You got a bait, which is a lead generation offer, like a report or a free sample or a free book. He gives some examples of funnels in the book. You got a front end offer, usually a lower price point. A lot of times this front end offer if you're doing paid advertising, we, we call it the self-liquidating offer. And essentially the goal is to acquire qualified buyers or to acquire a list of buyers by breaking even on the front end with that front end offer. Then you got a middle offer and a back end. You know, and that's how you can start a very basic funnel. And that's what he calls the value leader. 
And another important concept that he says to really help you before you launch your funnel, before you consider launching your funnel, is to reverse engineer a successful funnel. So let's talk about reverse engineering a successful funnel. So he says, before I start to build out any new sales funnel, the first thing I want to do is I want to find other people who already have a successful funnel and are selling to my target market. If I can't find other businesses, then I won't continue to move forward. If I can find others who are already successful selling to the chosen market, then I can reverse engineer what they're doing and figure out where they're getting their traffic. And I think that this is just a great exercise in general. This is something that I enjoy doing. I'm always fascinated as to why I make my own buying decisions. Whenever I buy something, whether it be on Amazon, a product, a service, a book, I always ask myself, why did I go and buy this? What influenced my buying decision? Was it certain ads? Was it certain conversations? Was it certain emails? I'm always trying to figure out why I do what I do as far as buying decisions and relating it back to the information that I present in this video and in this book and the principles of direct response marketing so I could see how I can recreate that scenario, maybe not necessarily for that product or service, but for the other products or services that I sell on the market. So we want to ask ourselves these simple questions. Where are our competitors, both direct and indirect? And what does that mean? Well, a direct competitor is a person who is co or a company selling something very similar to yours. In the supplement business, anyone else selling the same type of supplement is my direct competitor. We are trying to sell basically the same thing to the same people. People that you're competing against are potentially considering competing against. It's important to actually go through their entire funnel or go through their sequence and study their sequence. And he gives various tools and different kinds of resources to actually go and study the funnels. There's lots of you know tools on the web where you can kind of see what kind of ads they're running and so forth. And you want to see, is it competitive? Is it something that you even want to do? Does it require you to have deep pockets? Maybe they're just breaking even on the front end and a lot of money is made in the, in the back end. And thus, if you don't have a back end, you won't be able to stay competitive because they're breaking even on the front end. And if you think that the business is just that front end product, then you're probably not going to do very well over there. But doing this kind of research helps you come up with those educated decisions. There are also indirect competitors. These are people or companies selling something different than you, but to the same demographic. So I mentioned this earlier, people buy different things. The demographic might buy product X, and a lot of people are selling product X, but there's an opportunity to create product Y or Z, and there's no competition in that area. And a lot of times, because there's no competition in that area of pr selling product Y or Z, if you approach the best seller or the most competitive business in product selling product X, they're more likely to partner with you, and they already have a relationship with those clients, and they might consider doing a deal with you to sell product Y or Z. And then you want to look at what they're doing. So there's a website that he gave, similar web. I checked it out and you can essentially look at website traffic and a lot of different stats on different websites of your competitors to just kind of see what they're doing. That's a great start right there. So let's look at some five variables of a successful campaign. And when we're studying other campaigns out there that are successful, these are the important elements that we want to incorporate in our studies or pull out of our studies so we can keep them as swipe files so when we integrate it in our product or service, we'll be better equipped at making educated decisions. Number one is demographics. Okay, the demographics are the characteristics of the people you're targeting. Demographics define who belongs in the target group and who doesn't. We're talking about distinguishing factors like age, sex, education, geographical location, income level, race, language, and political aff affiliations, any and all characteristics you can think of that define those people you want to reach with your message. And the reason why we need this demographic data is because it's going to help us with ad targeting or specific kinds of content or messaging or wordsmithing our copywriting so we can speak to that audience in a way that's very influential, in a way it resonates with them, in a way it feels that how you communicate is exactly the kind of communication that they're looking for. Then it's the offer. The offer compels, uh, the offer comes down to what you are selling and at what price, price point you are selling it, including your upsells and downsells. Your landing pages, so again, I mentioned that we use ClickFunnels for landing pages, but there's tons of different landing page software out there. I'll put a link to ClickFunnels in the description 
I recommend it because it's very easy to create landing pages and test landing pages, and they got a lot of elements on there that have been proven to convert, and it's very easy to edit them. And you want to a lot of times when you're doing testing really fast, you want to be able to edit these landing pages and use best practices really quick. Okay, this is a page a person lands on right after they click on an ad, and I believe it's the most important page in your entire sales funnel. What does this page look like for your successful competitors? Is it an opt-in page? Is it a sales page? What's working for others right now? He says, I'm not going to make up my own landing page and hope that it works. I'm going to reverse engineer what's already working and model that for my own page. I'm going to make something very similar to what's already successful. Now, I resonate with this because a lot of things that I do is really just a result of looking to see what others are doing and then adding my own twist and personality and maybe serving the same audience in a maybe unique, better way. And, you know, I would always do this even from back in the days when I was like 17 years old and I saw there was all these uh, affiliate marketing businesses on the Internet. And I would just copy what they were doing and it would be profitable, set up the same campaign right from the gate. And then I would optimize and adjust it a little bit and then offer something unique to that same audience. Traffic source. Where is your competitor's traffic coming from? What are the specific websites that competitors buy ads on? Is the traffic coming from banner ads or social media or email? Does he use mainly video or text? And then ad copy. This is the last element of a successful campaign. What do successful ads look like? What makes people click on the ad? What's enticing them to even look at the competitor's ad in the first place? What pictures are the competitors using? What does the headline say? What does a body copy look like? Are the competitors doing video? All these things influence whether a person clicks on an ad or not. Now, I've seen a lot of individuals who just, you know, they don't necessarily have a very deep understanding of advertising or direct response marketing, but just follow the very astute advice here of reverse engineering, a successful business model, which is a funnel, remember that, and studying that funnel and replicating that to some shape or form and creating a business based on that because then you could fill in the gaps through your optimization of understanding. Okay, So your understanding is developed from a foundational funnel rather than starting from scratch. Imagine starting from scratch, not having no clue of business. That can seem very overwhelming. And I mentioned this earlier when I was doing this kind of stuff when I was 17. I didn't go down that route because I didn't know, I had no idea how this stuff worked. But if I just replicated a campaign that somebody was running, at least from there, I could figure out how the pieces work. Think about this like if you own a computer. Try building a computer from scratch and you've never been exposed to a computer before. It can be very difficult and even impossible. Well, if you have a computer that you buy and you kind of take it apart slowly, pull out the hard drive and see what happens when you unplug it and you start up the computer and just try little things like that, you'll be able to figure out how the things work. And that's the process and the understanding and the importance of reverse engineering other successful businesses and funnels. Now let's talk about the seven phases of a sales funnel. Okay, seven phases of a sales funnel. Now he mentions, and this is really important, it's all about the pre-frame. Experts in neural and just linguistic programming talk a lot about pre-framing to gain the outcome you desire. A pre-frame is simply a state of mind you place someone in as they enter into the next step into your sales funnel. Changing the frame of mind, the mindset can profoundly change the answer to a question or the experience you have with someone or something. And it could be something as simple as when you have a conversation with somebody, you start out with a positive and you change the vibe into a more positive vibe before you ask them to do something. And that's an example of a preframe. So it's important to preframe in the different stages depending on the type of traffic and depending on the kind of relationship that you have with that particular prospect. So phase number one, determine traffic temperature. The first phase is to examine is the mindset of traffic before it reaches your site or your traffic temperature. You may not even think about it, but there are three levels of traffic that come to your website, hot, warm, or cold. Or you could say three levels of traffic that come to your opt-in page or whatever the lead source, otherwise known as a lead magnet, which is essentially a element or a report or something that you give in exchange, like the one I use. Essentially, you get a copy of the mind map when you opt in and join my mailing list. That right there, there's different sources of traffic coming to it, hot, warm, and cold. Hot traffic is made up of people who already know who you are. They're on your email list. They subscribe to your podcast. They read your blog. You have an established relationship with them. 
you're going to talk to these people like they're your friends. So you would communicate in a certain way. And the goal is to, you know, convert people from cold into hot and then send them to a offer that would be related to somebody that would be more likely to buy because that's when when they're hot, when they have gone and build that like and trust with you through your process, that's more likely the time to build a or to set up a landing page where it's actual offer that can solve their product or service versus maybe cold traffic, sending them directly to the offer. And it's not absolute, it's worth testing, obviously. It's a little bit of a hurdle, especially if the offer is at a high price point. And so thus we have to treat that traffic differently. Warm traffic consists of people who don't know you, but they have a relationship with somebody you know. This is where you joint venture partnerships work well. Joint ventures, affiliates have relationships with their lists and they endorse you to their offer or endorse you or their offer to their list. They lend their credibility to you so their followers feel comfortable checking out your offers. And then finally, cold traffic. Cold traffic is made up of people who have no idea who you are. They don't know what you have to offer or even if they can trust you. They may be people you find on Facebook. Maybe these people find you on Facebook or click on your pay-per-click ads. Maybe they stumble across your blog somehow. Most likely you're paying for this traffic somehow. So it's important to pre-frame them correctly to get the highest return on your investment. Phase two, set up the pre-frame bridge. Okay, so hot traffic bridge is typically very short. You already have a relationship, we mentioned this, with these people. So you don't have to do a lot of credibility building or pre-framing. You can probably just send a quick email with a link to your landing page and that's it. A you know, landing page with an offer. A warm traffic bridge is a little longer than a hot traffic bridge, but not much. All that traffic needs is a little note of endorsement, perhaps from a person that they trust, and they'll be in the right frame of mind to go to the landing page. Cold traffic bridge. For cold traffic, you often need a whole separate page that they go through, otherwise known as the bridge page, before they hit the offer page. This separate pre-frame page educates people, enabling them to better appreciate the offer and making them more likely to convert. So a little bit of a you know warming up period through a page of information. I mean, you might see this on some ads that you click on. When you click on the ad, it goes over to a page where there's some kind of blog or report about whatever it is, and it's kind of warming the visitor up before they send them to the offer. Phase three, qualifying subscribers. The whole goal here is to take all the traffic, hot, warm, and cold, and find out who's willing to give you as an email address in exchange for more information. Next is qualifying buyers. Qualifying buyers, phase four. Immediately after you qualify your subscribers, you want to find out who among them is a buyer. How many of those 300 people who were interested in getting free information, for example, are willing to pull out their credit card and make a purchase? See, what happens is that if somebody inquires about something that is related to whatever it is that you are discussing, a content or a report or whatever that you gave them, if they're inquiring about it, then chances are that they might want that solution to the problem right away and they're willing to pay for it because whatever you're offering, your product or service, provides a solution to a higher degree beyond just maybe the free piece of content or the report. And they want it right away. So they're in that mode, they're interested in it, you've piqued their interest, but if you don't make an offer right then and there, you lose that opportunity. If you try to make the offer maybe a few days later, they might not be interested or they might have gone somewhere else and bought it. So we wanna qualify them right away by making an offer. And not everyone is going to buy, but if you make that offer right away, you're going to get a, a you know, handful of buyers, maybe even a lot of buyers, but that also depends on you know, other variables, like is your product or service actually valuable? Is the offer priced accordingly and so forth? And this is where testing comes into play, but that's something we wanna do. And we also, also wanna keep into consideration phase number five, which is identifying hyperactive buyers. So after you've identified the buyers, you want to identify the hyperactive buyers. These are the people who are in some kind of pain right now and will buy more than one thing at a time. Okay, So maybe you have a whole product line with upsells and so forth that offers an even higher level to the solution or a quicker level to the solution or a full implementation or something as a result. And if you make that offer, you attract those individuals into buying because they're already in that mode of buying. And they figure that, hey, why not just get the full thing that is going to give them the results faster, or add more value to the transaction and so forth. So we make an offer right away for those that will be interested in that. And that usually in, ends up being a smaller percentage, 
But hey, if you don't make the offer, then you don't end up getting the deal. And phase number six, age and ascend the relationship. Okay, so if you're if you follow these five phases on of the funnel up to here, you'll already move people through the first level or two or maybe even three of your ladder. Now you're going to continue to provide value and help people with whatever you offer. So you allow some time to pass. How much time is really up to you? Whatever feels logical for your product is best. Let them dig into whatever your product has to offer and that they've already purchased and give them enough time to really see the value that you give. And you're going to ascend them up into the ladder over a longer period of time, eventually moving them to the very top level. So this is where you can maybe do some partnership affiliate offers. You offer different kinds of product or service that are complimentary, invite them to a live event or something like that at a higher price point than what it is, offer some discounted bundles and so forth, different kinds of things to really keep that relationship going and adding value. Phase number seven, change the selling environment. So typically, it's difficult to sell super expensive products or services online. Not many people are going to read a sales letter and click a buy button for a $15,000 product. Some might usually, some might, but usually you'll have to change the selling environment if you want to sell high ticket products or items or premium offerings. The most common ways to change the environment are to sell the pricier items over the phone through direct mail or a live event or seminar. So usually when a client is ready and you believe that they're ready for a higher end item at a higher end price point, it's worth reaching out to them often individually and making it very personal once you've identified them and booking a phone call with them or even an in-person meeting with them in which you present to them this higher end offer that's of benefit to them that will you know dramatically increase their results or take their results to a higher level and so forth. But we have to keep into consideration that although we're talking about online sales funnels and click funnels, that changing the environment is important to sell certain kinds of products or services at a higher price point. So we want to keep that in our strategy. So these are the seven phases of a sales funnel. Now, there's a lot more covered in this book, okay? a lot of details, a lot of different nuance points and so forth. But the principles will always remain the same because they're sound direct response marketing principles. And that's why it's important that you can that you study as much as you can different sources of direct response information. Everything from email list building, you know, I did the video with Roy Fur. We also talked about direct response marketing in there. Different kinds of podcasts that talk about traffic and optimizing traffic and converting traffic, different kinds of data that's given on case studies and so forth, different marketing campaigns that were run, looking at what your competitors are doing and seeing how they convert audiences over to clients, funnels, backend, and so forth. All these different kinds of things are very important and probably the most important paramount thought that I would like to really make sure you've integrated into your understanding. Think beyond just the one product or service that you have to offer. If you integrate the philosophy and principles of funnels, then you recognize that Clients will buy again and again and again, provided you build a good relationship with them. And then a lot of those things that you sell in the back end, they can be very, very profitable, but require you to have a certain level of creativity in your thinking. And that's why I really recommend watching that video on Abraham Mindshift Challenge, because even though you might not be incorporating those principles directly, exactly like the examples given, it will stimulate your mind of different ways that you can really add value to your market. This presentation is brought to you by Gadget Media, special offer for those business and franchise owners that qualify. Running a successful Facebook marketing campaign can be a daunting task. There is code, analytics, optimization. Not only do you require a deep understanding, but a systematic application of the core and nuanced principles of direct response marketing required to make for a successful Facebook marketing campaign to produce returns on your investment. If you're looking for help managing your Facebook lead generation efforts, reach out to Mike and he will build you a custom lead generation funnel at no cost. You just cover the ad spend. Just call 949-371-6801 or check out their website at gadgetmedia.co for your Facebook marketing needs. I've also linked to their site in the description. If you want a copy of this mind map, the link is also in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this to be really useful and you're going to take and apply this to your business and really look at your business model and figure out how you can really get the most out of this very important process known as the funnel. And I recommend you also read this book and look into some of the work of 
Russell Brunson, as well as check out ClickFunnels. I'll put a link in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.